Party people, what is good with you? It is Saturday morning. We're going to talk some NWA power. This is the Power Moves podcast. I am your boy, BQ. If it's your first time here, let me lay out the channel for you. I cover TNA for the most part, 99% of my content. Every Saturday, I talk NWA power. So if you're looking for a power podcast, this is the place to be. Um, I'm not too concerned about... My streaming numbers and all that, uh, when it comes to this podcast, I enjoy watching the show. I enjoy talking about it, and it, and it um, gives me an opportunity to take a break from the TNA bubble a little bit and just expand my horizon. So we're going to talk NWA Power, which I've been kind of saying ever since they got on the CW app, they've really uh, stepped up everything from just the overall quality of the show to the production. Uh, the you know, the wrestling, um, I guess some of the stories, I, I get lost in some of the stories. That's probably one of the things I would change right now. Um, but, but they're putting on a good show. I got to apologize. Last week's podcast didn't sound particularly good. I had my, um, Microsoft Excel running in the background by accident. And when that happens, streaming does not sound good. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll skip. It'll, uh, it hurts the quality because, uh, the sheets that I run are very, there's a lot of formulas that I use for my uh, prop betting. So um, it did affect the quality. So I greatly, uh, greatly apologize for that. But let's get into this episode right here. This is NWA from May 21st, 2024. And we got our first women's match in, in close to a month. And this was a rematch. It was Tiffany Nieves and Reka Tahaka versus Ruthie J and uh, La Rosa Negra. So, um, as I said, it was a rematch. Reka Tahaka does not impress me. They say she's six one, and I, I, fuck, I don't see it. I could be totally wrong. I just know I've, like, I've taken a picture of Tiffany Nieves, and and she's taller. But there's not that much difference in height between Tiffany and Rekka when you see them on, on screen. So, um, man, I'm just not buying it. I, I said it last time, too. I, I could be very, very wrong. But um, she's never particularly impressed me. For some reason, they were teasing this dissension between the two of them. It's kind of unnecessary, in my opinion. And I don't know why there's dissension, because they're on, they're on TV so little. When, when, so... When I said I get lost in some of these storylines, it's because it's an hour program. The roster's relatively large. And when like a month passes between you, you know, revisiting an angle sometimes, it's very easy to look at and be like, I don't know what's going on here. So that that does happen over time. Now, what was particularly good about this episode was that Billy Corgan was on commentary for most of it, if not all of it. I don't remember if he did this opening match. And what Billy is really good at is, is, is just kind of like he's explaining and he's telling the story, the backstory, in a way that the current commentary team doesn't. There's a lot of, you know, Joe Galley does a pretty good job, but there's a lot of jokey jokiness in the commentary. The story isn't always told. When Billy Corgan is in there, he will run over the backstories. Uh, he will say, you know, he'll he'll help put over who's the baby face, who's the heel. He adds a dynamic that I almost wish he was always there. And it is a dynamic that I think is missing from the overall commentary of the show. So I always enjoy listening to Billy speak. I listen to all his interviews when he's doing one. I I enjoy hearing his vision. I think he does a very good job of communicating his vision in a way that I don't know other companies do, you know. But this was a good tag team match. I'm pretty high on Tiffany Nieves. I'm I'm pretty high on Ruthie J. I'm pretty high on La Rosa Negra. Like these are these are some really talented girls. Um, and Tiffany Nieves and Rekka Tahaka ended up winning this match. So good opening match. Um, again, this is the first women's match in a little while. I, I think I think there should always be a women's match, you know, whether it's opening or in the middle. 
But what was also nice about this is we probably had about three weeks in a row where the opening match was just a was kind of a turnoff in my opinion. And uh, this was not the case with this one here. Unfortunately, we did not get get May Valentine for another set of tapings. Um, so we got Kyle Davis, who um, he annoys me a little, man. Like I, I. But, but with, with all due respect, I think every ring announcer annoys me. Like to me, the only good one currently is uh, Justin Roberts. To me, he's like the only good ring announcer, and even he's getting a little hokey because he's he's involved with AEW. Um, I do think uh, Jay Chung is starting to do a really good job for TNA, but you know anyone else AEW uses the people on raw and smackdown maybe that's blasphemous in some people's opinions i just don't think they're good you know um obviously the ring of honor guys uh, he's very good uh but at the podium it's a southern six and pretty empowered so the, the southern six cuts a promo here straight out of fucking 1982 which is fine that's what works for NWA power, you know, just the the yelling and the f- catchphrases and the <laughs> fake laugh at the end. Um, pretty empowered. We have not seen him on TV in like a month and a half, and I really think they they are always one of the better parts of the show when they're involved. And I say this every time I see him. I'm just so impressed with their like physical transformation. Uh, they really take their spot in the card seriously. And uh, again, we're going back here to, to, I don't know the story. So Kyle Davis asks uh, Kenzie Page, you know, or, or says you're, you're awfully reserved. I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, awfully reserved about the uh, upcoming number one contenders match. I have no clue what number one contenders match is coming up. Like they have not, I, I, I think I followed the socials pretty well and, and watched the show every week. I, I don't know what they're talking about. Some kind of number one contenders match, and she's and she's saying, "Oh, I just have to worry about Taylor Rising, which Taylor Rising's really good." So, I, what's I still don't know what kind of match this is. Is this a multi women match? Is it a tournament? What is it? I have no freaking clue. And then they throw in that Ella Envy has thrown in her, or they Kyle Davis adds that Ella Envy has thrown her name in the hat to be a number one contender. The acting was a little hokey here. The the hokey acting acting actually works for uh, pretty empowered, but it was a little hokey. It was a little fake, and and uh, now they're gonna after we're teasing dissension in the opening match. We're now teasing dissension once again. TNA is doing it now. NWA is doing it. Then we get World Junior Heavyweight Champion Joe Alonzo. He takes on this Damian uh, Fenrir Fenrir. This kid is good. So what I appreciate about the junior heavyweight division is that the matches are, it took a while to get this division off the ground. They try to do it with this NWA USA on Saturdays or whatever they're doing in the past. And it just wasn't working. But it, it so the division, it, it, it took a while to come around. What I appreciate about these matches is that they're very different than everything else on the card. And that's what it should be when you're talking about cruiserweight division, lightweight division, X division. Like it should be different than everything else we see. And then to be does a good job with that. This was kind of refreshing because I feel like every junior heavyweight match is the same three or four people ra- wrestling all the time. And this wasn't a uh, title match, but it was just it was just something fresh. This Damian Fenrir kid, he has it. Billy Corgan in there was talking about charisma and the it factor. Like this kid, when they, when usually when NWA is bringing, I say this every single week, when they're bringing people from the indies, from these territories, they're, I always call them bingo hall, right? Like there's just, there are people who kind of work in NWA television because they, they film a certain way, but there are people that you're just like, you know, I, I wouldn't even say the girls because they do a good job skating the girls. But with the dudes, like they, they bring in so many that you just see them and you're like, I can't picture them ever being on any in any other wrestling company. I can't see them on TV anywhere else. You know, maybe maybe like an MLW, 
but that's it. Like I, I, I couldn't see him in TNA or even doing extra work a lot of the time for AEW. This kid right here looked great. He was athletic. He was good looking. I've often said as well that so in the first couple seasons they had Ricky Starks, right? And he was the only one that was considered like the young up and comer, the young gun on the roster. Like they had a couple younger dudes, but they weren't heavily featured. Ricky Starks was the only featured younger talent. Like he was considered uh, the, the future star. And ever since then, I felt like they were just kind of throwing shit at the wall with all these younger people. Like we're trying to find the next Ricky Starks. This kid is as close as you're getting to that. I don't know what kind of promo he cuts. I have no idea. But but again, athletic has size. You know, shows a little personality. He's good looking. I hope that this is someone that uh, they kind of find a way to keep around because I can see him playing a role in this company. And and he's someone I can see um, getting to the next level. You know what I mean? Like I feel like I could see him on other people's wrestling programs and the bigger companies. Which not that I'm not that I'm saying, hey, sign people so they can leave. I just mean if you want to be competitive in this in this oversaturated space, you need guys like this. So I was really impressed with him. Uh, he ended up hitting a um, I think it was a double underhook power bomb at the end. Um, sorry, I'm not I'm not really not even freaking referencing my notes at all here. Uh, what do you do? A razor's edge power bomb. I'm sorry, but he kind of tweaked his knee in the process, which, you know, didn't make him look weak. He just got hurt in the process. Then he takes a, gets his neck, neck hung over the top rope. And then uh, Joe Alonzo hits the the Joey special. So Billy Corgan was very helpful in commentary here, giving a uh, backstory on Fenrir and then putting Joe, Joe Alonzo over as a heel. So where if we were just watching this without him, there would have been jokes and there just wouldn't have been a backstory and, um, he added a lot to this. So I, I look forward to seeing this kid in the future. Every, I, I, you know, it feels like every time you put on power, there's some random person on the card and they're often in this spot here, this like junior heavyweight spot, but they don't really impress. You know, you're not like, Oh, I hope I see him again. This is the first time that I was like, I want to see this kid again. So I hope, um, I hope he's not just some local talent that they used. Uh, I hope that he he becomes a you know a player in this division, and because of the the, the finish and it, he wasn't squashed, uh, makes me feel like that's very much a possibility. And then um, after this, we we get uh, and Kyle Kyle Davis interviews him, and he Joe Alonzo's looking forward to defending against uh, Alex Taylor. As I said, it just feels like every time this title's on the line, it's the same Colby Carino, Alex Taylor. Um, his name is escaping me. The other guy from the Southern Six. Like it just seems like it's the same people. Then Daisy Kill and Talos are interviewed about their Crockett Cup match with the Stew Crew. This just screams indie outlaw all over it. From Daisy Kill and Talos to the Stew Crew, but they seem to be some jobbers out of Tennessee. I think uh, so. Daisy Kill and Talos should win this. And then the Slime Balls, who I've I've, I've Said to him, blue in my face. I think they're awful, but more power to them for trying to get a gimmick like this over. I just think it's for the indies, it's for the VFWs, and if it works there, awesome. I just don't. Even though NWA does things different, I just don't. <laughs> I don't like it. Maybe the girl on me one day. I don't know. They're this. I, I just find them annoying. And they're competing in the Crockett Cup. I forgot. Oh God, I forgot against who did I write it in my notes? Uh, oh, they're taking on the Southern Six, and they're they're going to lose. That's they're taking on the two best members of the Southern Six. Like that match might not even last three minutes. To be honest with you, and then they um they tease at Matt Cardona. They got the NWA Return of the Territories coming up. They tease that Matt Matt Cardona is going to play a role. He's, he's injured. He can't wrestle, but they do a much better job of utilizing Matt Cardona than TNA does. Cause I always say in my TNA reviews, they want him to be um, Zach Ryder. That's what, that's what they're looking for. They're, 
they're looking for that like WWE rub. So they want him to be Matt, Zach Ryder to where he gets to be Matt Cardona in NWA. And he's it matters when he's on the screen. Vampiro cuts this promo, this cryptic promo that goes on forever. And he's a good talker. Don't get me wrong. He's definitely a good talker. He's great on the mic. I don't know what the fuck he was talking about. It was cryptic as shit. It almost seems like, because he's been trying to recruit Natalia Markova, it almost seems like he's he's actually trying to debut her opponent. Um, because he said, I'm, I, I actually kind of want you to say no, because I think I have a better plan B. So I don't think Markova is going to join him, but I, I think he's, he's bringing a new girl into the company. That kind of, that's what I'm getting from it. Because, I mean, this went on for a while and it sounded good but he was saying nothing so we'll see and then it's it glitches and then it shows ec3 for like three seconds i don't know what what was that about and then uh getting into the crockett cup quarterfinal we got number two ranked trevor murdoch and mike knox they took on number 15th ranked miserably faithful and this was because there's different versions of miserably faithful this was gags the gimp and Salvation, Sal Renaro. You knew exactly how this was going to go. But again, this is the number 15 seed. They, however, did an excellent job of telling a story to where the miserably faithful almost pulled this off. Like, Knox and Murdoch are twice these guys' size. But, so, like, you watch these matches in AEW, and it doesn't matter if it's a, you know, they can be a squash match. They still seem to go. A squash match still goes 10 minutes, and then a, a, a glorified squash match still goes 20. You know, like it takes Will Ospreay 20 minutes to put away Lee Moriarty. And when I went to a, a collision taping and they were showing Ring of Honor, there was four squash matches that all went 10 minutes, 10 plus minutes, you know? The reason I bring that up is because the storytelling they did here in, in comparison to those matches I'm bringing up, this was a squash match, okay? On paper, this was a squash match. But they paced this in a way that Miserably Faithful got a couple moves in and almost like won the match or almost appeared to win the match without it being a competitive match. So it took them hitting, need, hitting need, excuse me, woo. It took them needing to hit their high low finisher on both guys to win the match. So very interesting that they weren't able to put these guys away right away. They're, Billy Corgan did a great job on commentary because Trevor Murdoch was pissed that they're not the number one seed, and he's kind of like, okay, you guys won last year. You guys can't beat the champions. You can't get over the hump. You can't be the number one seed, you know, which very much this might be the year that we get number one versus number two in the final. Then another Crockett Cup quarterfinal. I said I was going to give my predictions in the Crockett Cup, but they they te- they uh, not teased. They filmed TV so quickly after I did my review that you know the spoilers are already kind of out there. So I I just I wasn't going to go through it. The the matches already happened, you know. Um, this was. Excuse me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So after this, uh, I, I, I got I got ahead of myself. We get Aaron Stevens coming out, and he's talking, and he seems to talk on every single episode. And then Eric Smalls comes out and hits him below the belt. He tells him if you mess with Smalls, you get hit in the balls. So it was just Aaron Stevens cutting short jokes, and then Eric Smalls walking up. And and, and Murdoch and Knox are still in the ring here. Um. And, you know, Smalls walks up, hit him in the balls. I, I I like Eric Smalls. Like, he's not goofy like Hornswoggle, you know. He works in this company. I I, I kind of like him and, and what he does. And then um, backstage, <clears throat> Joe Kazana hyping up the country gentleman and the stew crew. I guess is the tag team champions from one of their territories. So I guess they're a big crew. Never heard of them. Um, we'll see what they can do in the ring. And um, I had no, I didn't have a lot of interest in this. And then we got, so this was really weird. We got the other Crockett Cup quarterfinal match. And Billy Corgan, again, on commentary, he's explaining why it looks the killer number 10. 
why why Maxi Impaler and and Jedias are number nine, and and you know this person has accomplished this, this person hasn't accomplished this. So that that is missing from any kind of tournament in wrestling. And the people who watch these bigger companies, I think, would appreciate these kind of things. They just don't want to give this kind of, these kind of things a chance, unfortunately. Um, but this was looks to kill Brian Idol and Natalia Markova, so she's the second female to ever be in this thing, to take on Jack Stane and Tim Storm. This match went about seven, eight minutes. I thought, when I was kind of given some early predictions when I saw the, saw the brackets, I thought Jack Stane and Tim Storm were probably going to end up in the finals of this thing. They didn't even make it out of the first round because they had a match here that was not good. Um, Tim Storm, I like Tim Storm. His work looked like shit in this match. He hit a cup, you know, he's just getting up there in age. He did a couple of kicks that looked like shit. When Brian Idol sent him into the the ring post, it looked like shit. So he's, I, I think he needs to be coming, coming towards the end of this run. But I also don't want him on commentary. <laughs> I, I, I don't want that again. So um, this was interesting. So what happened was uh, Markova eventually gets tagged in. Good use of her. She runs and hits a beautiful disaster, disaster kick on Jax Dane and then hits Tim Storm with it. And then Tim Storm, I don't want to say he no-sells it. He didn't no-sell it, but he he just gets up and then he puts the claw on uh, Markova. And I thought Markova should have just tapped out of the claw and they could have got the same effect. But he kept the claw on her. She even got to the ropes and she held on to the bottom ropes. Ref counted to five. He would not break the hold. And they get disqualified. So looks like he'll actually move on in this thing, which I wasn't expecting. And Jax, Jax Dane is trying to get Tim Storm off of Markova and he can't. And then they then it goes off the air. So. Um, Tim Storm's got a, a crazed look on his face. It was a little forced. Yeah. I don't know if like the Tim Storm heel thing is the way to get the most use out of him at this point. I guess we're gonna see. I don't really, I don't really want to see him wrestle Jax Dane. I don't think that'll be very good. But I'm intrigued. You know that they do a pretty decent job of going off the air a lot of the time with some kind of cliffhanger. So I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued to see what they what they do. But um wasn't expecting that. Wasn't expecting that kind of finish. And again, I thought Markova should have just tapped out immediately from the claw from a man twice her size. And then he could have, you know, he could have got the same effect by not letting go of the hold. This is the first time in years, if if not ever, that I've seen a disqualification because they didn't break a hold in the count of five. <laughs> you know. So those are just those like kind of things that NWA brings to the table that you just don't see anywhere else. And it's frankly kind of refreshing sometimes. So that's going to do it for me this week. Talking NWA power, pretty solid episode Four matches, um, probably one of their better episodes in a little bit. I think, I think it was a little better than a couple of the episodes they were doing with the uh, hard times pay-per-view, you know, not bad at all. So thanks for listening. I will catch you guys next time. I'm your boy BQ and I'm out. Peace.